question, why speciate when evaluating onychomycosis? There's some debate about whether one should even get a confirmatory test. I happen to feel like you should because we're in the business of making accurate diagnoses and treating as specifically as possible. And historically, dermatophytes are the most common organisms causing onychomycosis. Still the case in the United States, but non-dermatophyte molds are on the rise and those are very difficult to treat. <clears throat> so being able to predict negative prognostic factors with our patients is important. Be able to treat as specifically as possible is important. With non-dermatophyte molds, which is a, a large part of my practice, uh, the typical tests of KOH or um, PATH for PAS doesn't speciate, but culture and PCR both do. So if I suspect that it might be a mold, I'm much more likely to get a culture or a PCR, which will yield the appropriate result and then can be treat as specifically as possible. If you want to be growing out the T. rubrums or the molds, which are going to be the basis on your treatment, a uh, lab that specializes in that can be helpful. And uh, there are very few labs that do that. So the lab at Case Western uh, Center for Medical Mycology is uh, the one that we use. There are large hospital systems that in fact use that as their lab and they'll set you up. Uh, no conflict of interest, I do it just because I think it's a service to my patients. Obtaining a nail specimen, uh, the most proximal aspect of the diseased nail tends to be the highest yield. And so if one clips the distalmost aspect of the nail, you're going to guarantee a less positive outcomes than if you go deeper. And this can be done relatively painlessly, either with a dual action nail nipper, if you're clipping the nail plate and getting the attached debris, or with a one or two millimeter curette, which can be used to scrape the proximal most aspect. The first test, the clipping of the nail with the debris, is particularly suitable for pathology with PAS and or GMS because you have a real specimen that they can mount in paraffin, section appropriately, and put on a glass slide. Not so great for the culture where they want debris. So doing both, sending one if you're going to send it for pathology, and then scraping for debris and getting all of the hyperkeratotic debris, proximal most, putting that for the culture and or calcifloor stain is the best way to go about it. KOH is the potassium hydroxide in-office test. Cheap, quick, you get results within 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, good for the global health uh, system because you don't get reimbursed much for it. Um, and you can identify septate hyphae, you've made a diagnosis, uh, usually of a dermatophyte with that. So um, that is a reasonable first line, but it doesn't speciate, as we talked about before. Um, it's not as sensitive or as specific as some of the other tests. So it has advantages, disadvantages. Uh, clipping for pathology with PAS uh, is the most accurate of culture, KOH, or um, uh, compar comparing those three. But it incurs an extra cost because there's a laboratory processing fee and then a professional fee to read that out. But it's probably the most accurate, sensitive and specific, best positive and, predictive and negative predictive value of those three tests. But these all get trumped by PCR. So PCR now has the highest sensitivity and specificity, a quick turnaround time of a day or two usually, and highest negative and positive predictive value. So it sort of gives you everything at once. So if you had to pick one, and you don't, but if you did, PCR would be the way to go. It is becoming more mainstream. There are labs now that offer it more and more. Um, but if you've been practicing for 20 years, it didn't exist 20 years ago in a mainstream way. It's just come on in the last few years. I use all of them. And, um, and it really is a case-by-case -case basis. Most of it is based on my clinical suspicion. If this looks like a dermatophyte, they have tinea unguium or tinea pedis, I think it's going to be T. rubrum. Um, I might just get a, um, a culture uh, because it's going to back up what I think uh, clinically. I might get a path for PAS. I'm unlikely to do all of them. If it's something that's failed treatment, not a typical clinical presentation, I happen to be a referral center. At that point, I'm going to do culture and PCR and maybe path for PAS to try to cast as wide a net as I can and make a diagnosis. If, if I'm diagnosed, if I'm Treating uh, T. rubra monochromycosis, the most common type, the best treatment for moderate disease, moderate to severe disease, is still oral uh, terbinafine. The FDA approved dose is daily for three months. Aditya Gupta has published on this well where you can maintain the, uh, the killing concentration above MIC by dosing it 30 days on, 30 days off, and 30 days on and get two-thirds the total drug, but the equal efficacy in terms of concentration of drug in the system. So that's how I do it for T. rubrum. And if you happen to have a mold and it's aspergillus and you got lucky, 
that's probably a good treatment for that too, although aspergillus responds to multiple things. If you got unlucky and it's one of those non-aspergillus, non-dermatophyte molds, the most common being scopulariopsis, acrimonium or fusarium of those four, in addition to aspergillus, then the best treatment nowadays seems to be the two new topical agents, either aphenoconazole or tababorol. And they both seem to work in my patients anecdotally, in patients who have failed many other things. But there's also data on low MICs with those drugs able to reach the area in the nail where they need to, both matrix and bed, and it matches up clinically with the patients we've treated. Patients are anxious about liver toxicity. Patients are anxious about uh, all the side effects. And if you tell them they're getting one month off in the middle, it seems to go over a little easier as well.